In this episode of Mind Pump, we talk all about things you can do to help yourself lose weight that don't involve counting calories or, for that matter, counting macros. First off, we talk about why calories are important, why they do matter, why macros matter. But then we get into the things you can do that have nothing to do with counting calories or macros that we've found in our experience training clients for decades that has a tremendous beneficial effect. Um, we actually came up with five things you can do. Uh, the first one talks about drinking water. The second one talks about changing how you eat, the logistics, not just, I'm not talking about what you're eating, but literally change how you eat. We talk about eating more protein and vegetables, how to how your sleep affects your appetite. And then we talk about heavily processed foods. Any one of those steps will probably result in weight loss for most listeners. Combine one or more of them together um, and you'll find yourself having even more success. Now, this episode is also brought to you by one of our favorite sponsors, Legion. Now, Legion supplements are made by our good friend, Mike Matthews. Um, all of these supplements include scientifically backed ingredients and doses. So there isn't a single ingredient in these products that doesn't have extensive literature supporting them uh, from studies. Um, full transparency, all of his products. If you look at the labor, you, label, you know exactly how much of each ingredient is in there. So there's no proprietary blends. Every product is sweetened naturally. Um, there are no artificial sweeteners. Um, another reason why we like Legion, honest marketing. He doesn't sell baloney. He doesn't tell you false dreams. He's very, very honest with their advertising. And of course, all of his products come with a 100% money back guarantee. Now, if you're interested in Legion, Make sure you use the Mind Pump discount. We have a special discount for Mind Pump listeners, which is 20% off your first order at checkout. Here's what you do. Go to buy Legion. Legion is spelled L-E-G-I-O-N.com forward slash Mind Pump. So buy Legion.com forward slash Mind Pump. Go there, get the Mind Pump discount. And if you're currently a Legion customer, using our code will give you double rewards points. So you still get a hookup. Also, this month, MAPS HIT is 50% off. Now, HIT is an acronym. It stands for High Intensity Interval Training. It is the most effective way to burn body fat in a short period of time. Now, most HIT programs are written poorly. Uh, they increase people's injuries. They slow down people's metabolism because they focus too much on cardio. MAPS HIT, totally different. There's three levels to it. You go on the program, select the right level. You have exercise demos and descriptions. It's all set up for you. It's one of our most popular programs by far, in fact. Again, it's 50% off. Here's how you get that discount. Go to mapshit.com. That's M-A-P-S-H-I-I-T.com. And use the code HIT50, H-I-I-T-5-0, no space, for the discount. You know, yesterday um, I was approached by our staff to to write an article um, on a subject because of the questions that we get um, from some of our <laughs> listeners. And uh, the question that they get is, what do I do if, if, if macro counting or calorie counting doesn't work for me or is too hard? Now, now I remember that being an issue when I was a trainer. I remember with people, with, with a lot of clients, Oftentimes, the first steps were not counting uh, macros and calories because it was for for often, especially for people who, who were beginners into this whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, it's a it, it's a difficult thing to kind of grasp, um, and it can cause for some people it can actually cause uh, bad food relationships. Yeah, either. even just starting with calories and like knowing what your maintenance calories are that was always like a difficult thing because it's. You know, you just get some generic formula that people are trying to plug their information into, and it's just like not very realistic. Mm -mm. And like they don't realize how much their their like dietary habits change on a daily basis, and how like what the average of that really is. Yeah. Well, it really depends on to who I'm talking to, right? Like, you know, when you're when you're when you're talking to a uh, person aspiring to be a competitor one day, and you know, you're gonna have to get on stage one day and present your physique. Uh, the value of calculating calories and macros is extremely high. I mean, it's uh, you're you're competing at the highest level, and those details are extremely important. Oh, half percent could be first yeah. between first place and you know, yeah, fifth place. Exactly. So uh, that's a that's a no brainer to me. But when you're, it's a very small fraction of the population. Exactly. It it's is. A, and the other thing to consider is that calories have been on the back of food now for decades. 
We've been telling people that, you know, look at the look at the label, look at the calories, try to eat X amount of calories. And we're only getting fatter. Yeah, and it doesn't seem to be working for people. Now, I don't want to I do want to be clear, I don't want to confuse people into thinking that calories are not important. Um, calories are still very important. In fact, there is one rule in in weight loss or weight gain or weight maintenance uh, that you cannot get around. You absolutely can't get around this. And it's actually a law of physics, meaning it's a constant law throughout the universe as, long, as far as we know, but definitely here on Earth, which is energy cannot be created nor destroyed. So what that means is you, you can't just create energy out of nothing, and you can't destroy energy so that it disappears. It gets transferred. So if your body's gaining body fat, you're not gaining body fat out of nowhere. Your body has to take energy from somewhere else to create that body fat. And that comes in the form of excess calories. So when you eat too much, those extra calories are stored into body fat. Now, on the flip side, your body doesn't just burn body fat for no reason. It burns body fat because it doesn't have enough calories to fuel you, your body. So you can't burn body fat if your calories are too high. And this, this matters regardless of the diet. In fact... Right. All diets that cause weight loss. I don't care what diet it is. You can go from the, the you know the the reasonable like the Mediterranean diet to mm -hmm. the extreme and crazy, like carnivore diets or even crazier the you know whatever celery juice diet or whatever. All diets that cause weight loss. If whatever diet you've ever yeah. done, if it caused weight loss, it was because you were consuming less calories than your yeah, body. Whatever burning. form it is, you're reducing your calories at the end of the day. That's right. So that's why calories are extremely important. Now, back to what I was saying before, we've had calorie counts on food for a long time. And for a lot of people, now for some people it works, but for a lot of people it just doesn't work. And in fact, for some people, just looking at calories can cause uh, problems. It can cause them a little bit of obsession or they see what they can squeeze into their calorie count and then their diet becomes actually worse. I've actually seen clients do this where they'll cut their calories but you'll look at the foods that they're eating and they're not the best uh, choices. Or they'll remove food so they could drink alcohol to make up for the difference in calories. Actually, that was a quite common one. Like where I'll tell somebody, hey, you know, let's let's remove alcohol from your diet. And they'll be like, no, I'll just eat less food. <laughs> so yeah. They're kind of missing, <laughs> missing the whole point uh, of this. So calories are definitely very, very important. Macros are also very important. And if you're in the fitness space, uh, you've probably heard of people saying count your macros or did you hit your macro target? Or a calorie isn't a calorie. Right. Macros uh, macros stands for macronutrients. So short for macronutrients. Macronutrients, there's three of them. There's proteins, fats, and carbohydrates. Now those are important as well. So calories are important, but macronutrients are also important. By the way, macronutrients are what make up the calories. So Protein and carbohydrates, four calories per gram. So every gram of protein, every brand, uh, gram of carbohydrates equals four calories. Every gram of fat equals nine calories. So uh, fat is more calorically dense mm -hmm. per gram than protein and fat. Now, those are important as well, especially protein and fat. Protein and fat are especially important because there, there are essential amounts of either one of those that you need to consume. Meaning if you don't eat enough protein, there's a minimum requirement, or if you don't eat enough fat, you don't eat the minimum requirement of either one of those, your body will fail to thrive. And in extreme cases, you might not even live. You need to eat two of those because your body can't create certain uh, amino acids from proteins uh, from, from itself, and you can't create certain fatty acids. You have to consume them. Carbohydrates, you know, they can be important depending on your goals, but in terms of survival, you could go zero forever with carbohydrates. It's the only macronutrient you can do that with. Um, you can go forever without them, and you'll probably probably be okay. You can survive without them. You don't need to you couldn't consume them, in other words. Back to the calories, one of the main reasons why it became such a popular thing to cut fat out of your diet in the past. A high calorie. That's right. Like If, if I cut 10, cal 10 grams of fat out of my diet, I've cut 90 calories. If mm. I cut 10 grams of carbs or proteins out, I've only cut 40 calories. So the strategy back in the day was, hey, look, we know calories, you know, if we take in less calories and we burn, we'll lose weight. Why don't we just tell people to reduce fat? It's easy. Yeah. It'll cut the most Super calories. Easy. And on paper, it makes sense. Yeah. Didn't work though. Do you think Except, that was yeah, for fat being so satiating? 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. Do you yeah. think that was the original strategy of why we demonized fat? Do you think it's because of the, the high calorie intake? Of part it? of it. That oh, was yeah, part of it. Strategy. Then they had the seven, I think it was called the seven country study that came out. Um, Where they cherry picked it. Was it Dr. Ansel Keys, I believe his mm, name was? Yeah. He just and left out the other countries. Yeah, he studied a bunch. <laughs> he, he studied a bunch of countries and looked at the data, tried to figure out why um, heart disease was rising in, in developed nations. Took out the two countries that didn't follow the same pattern, only included the other seven, and said, "Hey, it's saturated fat and it's fat." And then, of course, when you look at arteries that are clogged, what clogs the arteries is fat. So it all kind of made sense. It became a big public policy by the U.S. government. Plus, fat was cal calorically dense. Everybody cut fat. Food manufacturers started mm. making foods that were less fat. People started buying less fat. Subsidized corn. And we yeah. and we kept getting fatter. Sugar, you know, the irony that of that is what Justin brought up, which anybody who's followed a ketogenic diet or a carnivore type diet would attest to this, that it's actually, it's harder than you think to overconsume just on fat. Mm -hmm. Oh man. Pairing fat with carbohydrates, different story. Sure. Right. Yeah. If you're eating carbs and fat, yeah, you can overeat fat easily, but I would attribute a lot of that to the carbohydrate intake and not so much the fat intake. Anytime that I've ran a diet that's like higher on fat, like a ketogenic diet or like a carnivore type of style, I, the struggle I always had was actually building on it, was mm -hmm. getting enough calories in to build muscle and sustain the amount of exercise that I was doing because you, know, you eat a couple – you know, it's for maybe a day or two, or it sounds amazing just to have steak or to eat lots of butter. You eat and eggs, bacon, and avocado, and you're, yeah. you're not going to, you don't want to eat for another four or five yeah. hours yes. at least. Yes, exactly. No, it's funny. And, and people kept getting fatter. So then we blamed it on carbs. And then people cut carbs and food started coming out that were low carb. And people kept getting fatter. And this goes back to the original point, which is, overeating at the end of the day, regardless of what your what your food comes from, you're going to gain body fat. So the big, big problem uh, is overeating. Now, that doesn't mean that food quality doesn't matter. It definitely does. In fact, food quality contributes to overeating. We'll get to that uh, later in the episode, I'm sure. But at the end of the day, uh, I don't care what your diet is. If you eat too much uh, or more than you burn, which is too much, then you're going to gain uh, yeah. body fat. Um, now, it's popular to count macros in the fitness space just to, hey, just hit your protein, fat, and carbohydrates, put the foods in that fit that, and that'll work. And that can be a good strategy. There are pitfalls to that, too. I've, I've, I've encountered quite a few people who become obsessed about that and, and get real creative at finding ways to squeeze in junk food or whatever into their diet so long as it fits their protein, fat, and carbohydrate, you know, model or whatever. You know what I find really funny is I, I was I was watching you when you were taking notes for this blog, right? As far as what you were going to write and the the points that you're making for the you know strategies for weight loss without counting calories. It's really funny to me how many of those strategies are like these like old ass things that used to be said forever that you should do <laughs> that we kind of scoffed at as young trainers. Mm -hmm. I remember that. And Absolutely. I feel, I feel really like doing an episode like this when we talk like this, it kind of also always reminds me of what a terrible trainer I was back in the days because we would take some of this like basic type advice, advice which we'll go over today, and we used to kind of shit on it. Because, oh, this new study came out to show that this is more effective to do this. And that what is just water or sleep? That's not a big deal. This mm -hmm. is where we need to be focused on. And the irony of that is that these these kind of really basic principles um, are really important. And if most people spent more time kind of focusing on that, it, it's funny on how many of them would kind of just fall into suit where they should be calorically. Totally. If you have to consider, you're working with humans here. You have to consider their psychology. You have to, hum you have to consider the human human behaviors and psyche. Uh, I'll give you an example. There was a study done years ago on a small town that passed a law that told all of its restaurants uh, that they had to post uh, calorie counts on all their foods because the, the town was suffering from an obesity issue, just like most towns in America. And they thought, okay, people need more information. If we just put the calories up, then people will know to choose the salad over the, over the burger or whatever because they'll get like less calories. So they ran this study for a little while, and what they ended up finding was that people were actually eating more calories because mm. they were posting calories. Now, on the surface, it doesn't make any sense. You think to yourself, well, why would they eat more? But let's let's consider human psyche for a second. Consider the average person looking at a menu who's hungry. Okay, Think of yourself. When you're hungry, 
What kind of psyche are you working with when you're hungry? Now, now imagine you're looking at a menu. Imagine you're not a fitness expert. Mm-hmm. You're not a fitness fanatic. You're the average person. Maybe you're listening right now, and you are an average person. You're hungry. You're looking at the menu. You see the super tasty cheeseburgers, 800 calories. You look at the boring-ass grilled chicken sandwich. It's 600 calories. Are you going to say, oh, I'll take the, 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 I'll take the 200 calorie deficit so I can go yeah. 600? Or are you going to say, wow, that's only 200 more calories. I'll that's, go with the burger. I'll do the burger without the fries. That's yeah, exactly yeah, what yeah, happened. Exactly. People were making choice, the bigger choice, because to them, they're looking at it and going, oh, it's only a few more hundred calories. Yeah. Not a big deal. And consider this, when it comes to how we eat, is our eating at all often logical? It's almost never logical. <laughs> it's almost always uh, yeah. behavior, emotion, context. Uh, you know, who we're with, you know, cravings, all that kind of stuff. So this is why calories and macros are important information, but it's also why counting calories and counting macros has just never worked long term for most everyday people. So I think what we what would probably be good is if we went through and and this took me a long time to learn as a trainer. It took me, I don't know, five to ten years, <laughs> a long time, where I finally sat down and said, Okay, uh, giving my clients meal plans, giving them calories, giving them also, you know, proteins, fats, and carbs, it only works in the short term. It never works in the long term. It wasn't really the lack of information. And I think where we're at now, like it's all available. I think now it's really about figuring out your own behaviors and your own patterns and really like honing in on how to add something small that you're not really going to notice right away that's going to have massive impact. Totally. Now, here's 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 the first one. And this one was funny to me because I actually, on accident, Introduced this to my clients. So, you know, it's the listeners, as you, if you've been listening for a while, you know that I started working out because I wanted to build muscle. Um, and so I looked up to bodybuilders uh, in my early days of working out. And bodybuilders always talked about drinking lots of water, a gallon of water every single day because it fills out your muscles, it gives you better pumps, mm-hmm. improves your recovery and strength. So I became an advocate for drinking uh, a lot of water. So even in the early days when I was giving clients macro targets and all stuff, I would always say to them, I want you to drink a half a gallon to a gallon of water every day. And what I would say is uh, when you go to work or whatever, take your gallon, bring it with you, and get, use a clear container and watch it. And just I don't care what else you do, whatever, just drink that throughout the whole day. And without all, all that, this naturally would happen very, very uh, on its own people would start to report less and less calories to me. And what I noticed is when you drink a gallon of water a day, you don't drink too much other stuff. Well, yeah, right? you're busy. You're, bu- yeah. <laughs> you're busy. Yeah. You're busy. Dr- this is what, this is why it's one of my, and I know that on, on this show, even we've, we've razzed. I haven't. The other two guys have <laughs> razzed the bodybuilder guy who carries the, the gallon jug around and stuff. But I'm, I'm a huge advocate for, for this exact reason. Um, you know, it's another one that's a that you don't think about that ends up happening, especially for a guy like me. I have a small bladder. I probably go to the restroom probably ten more times in a day when I force myself to drink a gallon. Automatically first, more o- steps. Automatically, uh-huh. automatically more steps. And then mm. two, I'm also my mouth is busy. Mm-hmm. It's it's busy trying to make sure I get all that water in for the day, and it's not throwing snacks and other things. And you'd be surprised. How many times we think we're hungry, but we're yeah. really thirsty? There, that's actually a huge one. Um, if it, right. oftentimes when you're dehydrated or your body wants water, you'll reach for food. That is a that is a, a been established. Here's another one. I mean, here's the other thing about it. I said earlier, people aren't drinking juices, sodas, or flavored drinks, and you think, well, that's not that big of a deal. Actually, it is. The average American consumes generally about eight to ten percent of the calories from drinks. So if you're if you're the if you're an average American and let's say you're consuming, I don't know, twenty five hundred to three thousand calories a day, right? Cut ten percent off the top because you're not drinking your calories. Yeah. That's two hundred and fifty to three hundred calories out of your day just because you're drinking too much water to worry about. Yeah, I wonder stuff. too with those flavored drinks, like if that doesn't just still promote like your 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 craving for an actual food as a result of like wanting to taste more flavors. They they sure do. Um, and f- when they do studies on artificially flavored, because you might be think you might be listening thinking, oh, I'll, I'll drink that, but I'll just do my branch right, like, acids. like zero yeah calorie drinks or whatever, but they still have flavor. Yeah, studies are pretty conclusive on this. Um, unless everything's completely controlled and the person's only given the food that they can eat, whatever, in the real world, 
when people substitute their sugar drinks for their artificially flavored drinks, they don't lose any weight because they naturally consume more food as a result because it stimulates your appetite. Yeah. Their appetite stimulating and they do change our cravings for more palatable food. So the 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 key here is not to think I'm not going to drink anything else. You don't even have to do that. Just try and drink a gallon of water every single day and watch what happens naturally. And that's that was the thing. I would see my clients just naturally drink tons of water, but naturally stop drinking as many other calories, uh, you know, from other foods. Well, haven't they haven't they linked things too to dehydration with slowing down the metabolism too? Isn't there isn't there some value to just staying hydrated for uh, metabolic reasons too? Yeah. Now it now that's a smaller effect, but yeah. if you were to add that up over time right it definitely would have no it's just one more again it's just it's one more little thing that it just continues to add value to why you do that and again it's this this old thing that we've been saying forever that is went out of favor for me as a trainer early on and then it's something that i've now it's become like a staple thing that i tell clients by the way here's some side effects of that if you ever suffer from uh irregular bowel movements, constipation, drink a gallon of water a day. Oftentimes that solves a problem. Here's the other one, your skin. The number one comment I would get from my female clients when they would start drinking a half to a gallon of water a day is they'd come and tell me how much better their skin looked. It looked younger. Well, it was just dehydrated before. It didn't, mm. it, which causes more wrinkles and it gives it that, that different look. Now, when should you be concerned about adding electrolytes in terms of like your activity and like seeing like that in terms of your loss of fluid? If you're drinking distilled water, not a good idea. Yeah, <laughs> right. Definitely Dist- not. Yeah, distilled water has no you want minerals. minerals. Yeah, yeah. Drink regular water, um, uh, mineral water. If you don't need to add electrolytes, if you're if you're doing that, um, if you're drinking distilled water, not a good idea. Drink a gallon of distilled water a day. You might cause yourself some problems, some big health problems. So I'd stick to mineral water, regular water. Um, and if you season your food normally, you're probably fine. The only people I would ever have add electrolytes are like endurance athletes or people who right. really sweat, like construction like workers. Serious activity levels. Yeah. 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 I would have clients who are in construction. And I'd tell them to put like a pinch of sea salt. Or you're down like in, in that serious humidity and heat and you're just constantly losing, you know, sweating it out. All totally. Time. Totally. Now, uh, here's another one. Um, changing how people eat. Now, I don't mean changing the foods you eat. I mean the logistics of how you eat. This one cracked me up. Uh, as an early trainer, I, w- I would have laughed at this for at least the first 10 years I was a personal trainer. But telling P- – here's a big one. This one, I, I learned this myself uh, not that long ago. Um, don't drink any any fluids while you eat. Yeah. Not drinking fluids while you eat actually makes you eat less. Yeah. Um, and the reason, you got to chew your food more. It's really annoying at first. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to go ahead and say that firsthand. I think there's one that uh, we're watching accelerate uh, before our eyes that's extremely important. That uh, one I also probably scoffed at years ago that I think is really, and I catch myself doing it all the time, is um, watching watching television or being on my phone while I eat. Mm-hmm. Such a simple thing that if you were to discipline yourself that eating time is for eating time, separate that from your social scrolling or even if you're justifying as work that you're doing or entertaining yourself and just eat what a difference that is it's really easy for me to be sitting on the couch watching my favorite show or something and watching myself just kind of out of habit you know picking into something and continuing to eat and shovel food into my mouth and so not allowing yourself to eat while watching tv or be on your phone while you're sitting down there and eating. So there well, was, yeah, even training clients, I would find myself in between, like like going from one gym to the other because I used to drive across town, uh, not having much time. So just like trying to cram it in as I'm driving, and you know, just getting caught in that sort of pickle. Where later on, I figured out like if I if I don't have the time for it, I just you know I probably shouldn't eat and, and eat later and like really concentrate on you know like the the quality and the, and slow down so I can eat my meal. Properly. Right. So so the brain, the body receives signals when you're eating that tell it you're eating, we're getting enough food. Okay. Now let's, let's send out the hormones and chemicals that say we don't want to eat anymore. Okay. Part of that is chewing your food. Chewing your food sends a signal. Saliva production sends a signal. Obviously the food that you swallow that goes in your gut sends a signal, but so does observing the food. The fact that you're watching yourself eat it is part of that signaling process. There was a report that was published in 2013 in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, and they they looked at a bunch of different studies on distracted eating. 
And they found that being distracted tended to make people eat more at every meal. It also mm. was linked to uh, uh, to to uh, paying attention. Excuse me, was linked to eating less later on. So when people paid attention to eating, they ate less while they ate, and they also ate less later on. When people were distracted, they ate more both times. So it actually makes a significant difference. And what's cool about this is it's you know just like the first one. You're not necessarily taking foods out you're and not, getting complicated. You're not weighing. You're not measuring. You're not mm. counting anything. You're not making a big. You're not telling yourself I can't have something. All you're saying is, be fucking present yeah. when you eat. That's it. Don't turn on the TV. Don't turn on the phone. Sit down. Don't drink any water and eat. Now there are. There's another way, and this one's really funny, but it's got several studies to back it up, and I've tested it, and it for sure works. Eat with uh, a vanity mirror. <laughs> no, yeah, watch Ooh, yourself. Look at you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, this one works um, actually exceptionally well, and I think it's because it causes us to, again, have to become aware and pay attention, and that is to eat your food with your non-dominant hand. Oh, this is like the tip I gave the other day about the switch hand, right? Switching yeah. back and forth. Mm-hmm. It's, it's again, it just it makes you hyper aware, right? Mm-hmm. You could because you could technically be sitting down eating, not having a phone, and not having a TV so in be front lost of you. In thought. Right, be lost in thought, be distracted doing something else, but. Try eating with your non-dominant hand or switching between bites every single time, and it just makes you hyper present. Yeah, I've had, uh, I've actually tracked clients use these techniques of eating differently, not having uh, fluids, um, eating with a non-dominant hand, not being uh, distracted, and usually on average, that alone would equate to about one to two hundred calories a day less. Which people are like, it does. That's not a lot of. No, that's significant. Do that throughout the whole year. You're talking about pounds and pounds and pounds of body fat from a very, very simple thing. And these were people, I didn't tell them to change what they were eating. I didn't say change anything else. I literally said, let's change how you eat, the the logistics of it. And the the reason why all these things I think are so important is is because more, more than anything else, it makes us become aware. Mm-hmm. Even if it's not something you like, I don't, I don't eat right now. Like some of these tips we're even we're going to give, like it's not like every single time I eat, I switch hands. But because I've done techniques like this, because I've taught these things, it's made me extremely aware on my habits and my behaviors and what I'm capable of. Like I brought up the other day, like man, it really easily. I mean, pay attention when the next time you eat. If you're not someone who's ever tried any of these things, how often you are already cutting and and the next bite. Is shoveling in Ready before before you finish swallowing the oh, last one. Even just putting the the food on my plate, I know for this is such a like a, like a like a duh kind of a thing. Like I used to eat with these huge plates and and just like that well, that behavior of me just like grabbing some some rice or, or putting making sure like I'm filling the plate up like just subconsciously I wanted it wanted it to feel like you know the plate was filled and so just having like a smaller version of that and just like replacing my huge plates with just something a bit smaller you know tended to help a little bit with the they, portion size they actually did a study on that and they showed that people consistently ate less because the plate was smaller yeah, so simply, simple, because, yeah, it's just like shrink it down. What a, a great business idea, the weight loss plate. Yeah. We'll, we'll look <laughs> at what the a- average dish yeah. plates are. We'll make saucers. it one inch smaller, Doug. Yeah. yeah. This is brilliant. Yeah. Fill your plate up. Yeah. Yeah. Like this big. Yeah. So, <laughs> you can eat whatever you want. It just has to just fit on the plate. Just got to fit it right there. <laughs> yeah, that little spot. People get creative and they'll start <laughs> stacking uh, stuff. Yeah, yeah, all vertically. <laughs> on top. Um, here's another one that I like. Uh, and this one, you know, Adam is a big, huge advocate. It's actually one of the ones you typically will bring up when we talk about this topic, Adam. Um, and this is that to rather than take away from your diet, because the psychology that happens when you're you're restricting, when you're taking away, it tends to cause you to want to rebel. Anything that gets taken away or anytime you deny, if it feels like you're denying yourself something, you want to come back and, and rebel. You want to overdo it the next time. And so diets tend to contribute to that, right? I'm cutting everything out. And then when you go off the diet, you binge and go in the complete opposite direction. But rather than cutting away, why not start by adding? Right. It's total counterintuitive, right? You want to lose weight. Rather than cutting food out, let's start by adding healthy foods, namely protein. And I like lean proteins for this for this particular one. Proteins and vegetables. Now, why would adding more chicken breast and you know lean steak and vegetables why would that be a good? Uh, why, how would that help people when they're trying to get lean? Well, it, what ends up ha- more what ends up happening, which is so great, is 
that's why it's this is I mean I don't remember what point in my career that I figured this out but it was it was a game we talk about game changer or pivotal moments paradigm shattering moments this is for sure one of those as a coach trainer that I pieced together way later in my career that when I stopped telling clients they can't do something and I just started to give them and what's great is they don't even know you're doing it to them like so like uh, right now I'm helping somebody with their with their diet and I'm all same same process with everybody I start them off with I tell them listen and she's like tripping out cuz she's like what I can go have all that you said I could have I said yeah eat whatever you want eat normal whatever normal looks like for you don't restrict anything and then I'm like we're almost on her la- her last her seventh day of like food right and I can see what her average calories is. I can see kind of where she's at. And the very first thing that she's going to get from me is, I, and I already know, so she she's challenged, challenged on Saturday and Sunday, which is super common, right? Mm-hmm. That's a, She had a big old bowl of chips and salsa. She had a, a drink on Sunday fun day with her girlfriends. And then, uh, can't, oh, then she had some sweets on the other day. So instead of me saying, you can't have any of those things, I'm going to give her this goal. On Saturdays and Sundays, I'm going to tell her I want you to have a giant chicken salad, and then I want you to have a bowl of your favorite vegetables, Brussels sprouts, spinach, whatever you want, and that's all I want you to do for now. And I know she's going to trip out. She hasn't even got this from me yet. But what I know is that when you do that, all of a sudden, it it leaves less room for that other shit. Yeah, totally. So the, it'll, uh, it sh- and, but she won't be focused on, Adam said I can't have chips. Adam said I can't have this. I can't. She'll be focused on, oh, I just need to make sure I get what he said in the day. And what I know naturally ends up happening is it ends up replacing something else, yeah. which is normally it less likely. It starts altering this. their palate a bit, too. So it's like you start to naturally crave uh, these types of nutrients through these types of foods. And it brings that, that to attention in your diet. And I think people start to seek those out a lot more. Well, and then and then to that point, then the follow up as a coach for me is, you know, I get her to do those things. And then I follow up with questions like, you know, how did you feel? Mm-hmm. And how do you feel today? Like the next day and stuff like that. And I start making the connect like, oh, man, I felt really good. I slept really great or I have lots of energy today. It's like, ah, see, you were you were missing. We weren't getting enough fiber. Or we weren't getting enough lean protein in your diet. See what happens when you feed the body, how much better and more productive you are. Now she makes that connection not to like, oh, when I say no to these bad things, yeah. this is why mm-hmm. I'm skinny or I feel better. No, it's when I when I make you eat the things that your body needs and wants Look at what it makes you feel like. And then that what that does is it switches their thought process into this like I can't or can thing and like, yeah. oh, I want these things in my diet. Oh shit. It gets rid of the punishment sort of attitude towards and it. And then then yeah. then they start seeking after more of that in their diet. It changes the psychology of everything. Right. Well, protein, well, foods also have what's called a thermic effect. And that now what that means is that in order to take food, turn it into calories, or excuse me, turn those calories into energy actually cost energy to do that in the body. And the body's pretty efficient at doing this, but but not all foods and macronutrients are created equal in this uh, regard. Protein has the highest thermic effect. I think the thermic effect is something like 20 or 30% higher for protein mm. than it is for fat or, or, or non-fibrous carbohydrates. Meaning if you eat the theoretically, and some studies have actually shown this, theoretically, if you eat the same amount of calories with two diets, but one was very high protein and the other's we're made up of, let's say, more carbs and more fats. The high-protein diet, people tend to lose more weight because the body burns more calories processing and turning that protein into energy. So it's just also it, – it, it's a it's A, a less small if, effect, but over time may add up. Yes, yeah. yes. And same thing with fibers. That's why I said vegetables. Fibers also have a high – thermic effect. They actually burn more calories to turn into energy than other types of foods. These are, these are also two things that are grossly uh, under-consumed by the, by the, nor- the average person. Mm-hmm. Not when I'm talking about the, the hardcore gym goer, bodybuilder, competitor person, but the average client is, uh, is normally lacking in lean protein and veggies, which is, and I know this whole episode is geared around uh, you know, uh, things to do without tracking calories. But I've had tons of success with actually just telling clients to only track that. Like only all track protein. Protein. That's yep. all I want you to do. Here's yep. how many grams yep. of protein I want every day. And just make sure you you hit that. Mm-hmm. And and I would tell them like, okay, our goal is to make sure we have a nice balance of chicken, fish, steak, and eggs. And like, so I'd say you try and mix that up and I'd watch that. But if as far as just tracking grams of protein, I've seen uh, clients have tons of success just from following that macronutrient because it's such an under Yeah, and it's the most satiating. In other words, it, it satisfies you and, and it, it blunts hunger more than any other macronutrient. In fact, the number one comment I would get from clients when I would do exactly that, Adam, I'd tell them, okay, I want you to hit, you know, let's say I have a 
female clients, 170 pounds, they'd say, I want you to eat 140 grams of protein and it has to come from food. Right? I'm not going to let you cheat and drink protein powders, but it's got to come from food. They would always come to me and be like, I can't eat that much. Mm-hmm. I can't eat 140. How, how does anybody eat that much? I'll say, look, eat that first, get that out of the way, and then see what else you can And inevitably, their calories would drop because that, many, that much protein or, and vegetables would result in a much lower appetite. Now they're eating less of the other garbage, and their calories went down. Not to mention a high-protein diet, if you're working out and lifting weights, contributes to muscle gain. At the very least, muscle preservation. So when you're dieting and you're trying to lose weight or lose body fat, inevitably your body's going to lose muscle. It wants to lose muscle. It wants to make you more efficient with calories. A high-protein diet, especially in com- combination with resistance training, stops that from happening. In some cases, actually reverses it, even on a low-calorie diet. So you don't get the metabolic slowdown that you would get from other uh, low-calorie diets. So high protein in, in 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 a diet, regardless, has lots and lots of different benefits. Of course, there's individual variances, but yeah, if you're aiming for protein and veggies and don't worry about anything else, naturally your caloric intake will probably drop. Well, and again, back to circle back to what I was talking about. Most people under eat this. This is sometimes why uh, people struggle with building muscles because they're just not getting adequate protein to build that, which in turn ends up speeding up everybody's metabolism. So. Mm-hmm. You know your your ultimate goal may be weight loss or body fat lo- reduction, but when you're under consuming protein and you're also lifting weights, and that's part of what because you've heard from Mind Pump or whatever, it's one of the best ways for you to do that. Well, it's important that you're getting the protein intake to support that, so that you can build muscle, which then in turn can help speed your metabolism up. So the benefits of targeting protein like that, or and I also highly recommend doing it early. Early and often, it's hard. Like it's you gotta hard. prioritize it. Yeah, prioritize it early, early in the day, especially since uh, breakfast foods are built around carbohydrates. Really try and focus on getting some good protein in early in the day, and you'll see huge. Benefits well, just to that. give you an example, uh, uh, let's say you have a 130 pound um, female, not obese, maybe a little overweight, but not obese, 130, 140 pounds, and I tell her, I want you to eat uh, 120 grams of protein a day. So. Um, and if you're listening right now, the target should be anywhere between about maybe 0.6 to 1 gram of p- protein per pound of body weight um, if you're not obese. If you're obese, then you might want to go more towards the, the lower end. If you're not uh, obese, then you go more towards the higher end. But 120 grams of protein, how many chicken, how many four ounce or three ounce chicken breasts would someone need to eat? To get about 120 grams of protein. Well, you're getting th- about 32 in a six ounce. In a six ounce. Right. So you'd have to eat <laughs> a lot. Yeah. You'd have to mm-hmm. eat quite a bit. Three and four, four of those chicken breasts a day. Yeah. So now- And think- how many 130 pound girls do that? Right. So yeah. now think about it this way. You're you're eating that. You're prioritizing it. It's naturally going to make you eat less food. So this is why it's such a great uh, first step. Okay. Here's another one. And this one is actually much more impactful uh, than you realize. Um improve the quality of your sleep and get adequate sleep. This one is actually a huge one. I was looking up studies earlier on the impact of uh, lack of sleep and researchers find that people will consume on average up to 300 more calories a day when wow. they're not eating, when they're not getting good quality well, sleep. Well, I don't, I think it was Justin who brought it up a while back. I don't know what we were talking about, but it just had fallen on some days where I, I mean, we were up with the baby and had some like long days of no sleep and, and running them back to back. And I remember I'd had this like junk food craving that I hadn't felt in a long time. And it like dawned on me like, oh shit, you know, I'm running on like no sleep the last couple of days. Pay attention to that if you're listening right now on days when you know you didn't get adequate sleep or you've been stressed at work all day long or up late hours and pay attention to your eating habits from that time. Almost always, that's when like those worst cravings come in is right. when you haven't got good sleep. Now, there's two hormones uh, that help regulate hunger, ghrelin and leptin. And so ghrelin stimulates appetite, makes you hungry, or leptin decreases it. But when the body is sleep deprived, the levels of ghrelin spikes Mm. while the level of leptin falls, leading to an increase in hunger. Now, why why would that happen? You might be asking yourself, like, why would a lack of sleep, why would that send a signal to my body to raise the hormone that makes me hungry and lower the one that, that controls my appetite? So giving me a kind of a, a you know, one-two punch. Yeah. Well, lack of sleep for most of human history, uh, well, it's, it's a stress on the body, but for most of human history- You're in survival mode. You probably were looking for food. You didn't yeah. have enough food. So you're, you're not sleeping because you're looking, you're foraging, you're trying to 
feed yourself. And so your body's saying, driving you to get that food so you can get that that rest. So lack of sleep, just plain and simple, makes you hungrier. Then there's this other simple uh, effect from losing sleep. When 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 you look at, so years ago, uh, I learned this tip from another trainer, and I, I saw that it was remarkably successful, but it was counter to what I had learned in the early nu- nutrition certifications I had gotten. And the advice was this, uh, don't eat past 6 p.m. So he would say, don't eat past 6 p.m., and clients were were getting leaner. Now, I had learned in my nutrition certification that it didn't matter what time you ate. It was all about the calories in versus calories out. So I was like, that's weird. Why would t- the time that you eat make any difference? Now, the studies do show that the time you eat you know, has an impact on your health and other stuff. But when it comes to weight, calories do matter. So why is it that when people stop eating at 6 that they end up losing weight when, and people who don't? Don't lose weight. I, they get better sleep. Well, they're, they're, they're better digestion, like all that kind of it's stuff. It's not just that. It's that people who don't stop at six or whatever eat more meals. Mm. And so they find that the extra bad calories that people tend to eat tend to be late at night. Well, it there's tend a, to happen late at night. A lot of those. I mean, it's a, I think it's a, it's a combination of everything. I mean, even what Justin's saying, I think is true also because uh, I've seen huge benefits by simply just walking yeah, after. It's made like a massive eat. impact on me. Yeah, if you eat, if you eat, try this. If someone hasn't done this before, eat a massive meal, overconsume when you know it, and then lie on your couch Ugh. or go straight to bed. <laughs> and you now do that exact same thing, overconsume whatever, but then go for a forty-five minute hour walk, mm-hmm. and you'll you'll see you'll feel the. Digestion digestive process happening but it definitely takes that if you overate that much you can feel it happening mm-hmm. and taking that entire time so imagine you not doing that and going straight to bed like of course it's going to yeah. uh, affect sleep now, like now, that. But, but besides that because that's for sleep quality just staying up late you stay let's say you should be in bed by 10 you stay up till midnight that's two more hours you're awake yeah watching tv bored whatever you're the odds that you're going to eat are far higher than if you were sleeping. Well, it's the, it's part of the reason why there's such great results for intermittent fasting for fat loss results is mm-hmm. because it's just a shortened window. Like right? mm-hmm. you're shortening the window window up. You're not eating past six o'clock. Which again, like to you, a, a tip that I used to scoff at because the research came out later on to prove that it didn't matter when you ate the calories. Calories are calories, and your body will either gain or lose based off of where your your maintenance level is. It has no nothing to do with if I eat it at midnight or eat it at 10. And so this was something I scoffed at and would tell clients not to worry about. But later on, again, circled back to, it's just a good habit for most people. It is. Most people, like you said, they are either one, you're pretty sedentary then, you're, it's and you're not going to be moving around to help the digestive process. You're sitting down, you're lying down, or you're doing things like watching TV, which can turn into mindless type of eating. So there's a lot of behavioral things that happen from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. that probably shouldn't be coupled with also eating more food. Yeah, and also like, you know, around dinner, like that's always my hearty meal. That's that's the one where I got the most, the, the, the protein the fast, the stuff that's like very satiating versus the, you know, the start of my day. If I was to include like more carbohydrates, I'm going to want to, you know, eat them, uh, you know, more towards the beginning of the day. So I'm more likely to, you know, expend energy and like get through that throughout the day. Yeah. But if you look at like, if let's say we were take, you know, like a hundred random people and, you know, track all their food and look at what they ate throughout the whole day, I can almost, I, I would bet, I would bet a lot of money that the vast majority of the quote unquote bad foods were done in the late evening. That's when the food choices tend to get a little oh, bit worse sure. throughout the day. Part of it is the psychology. Part of it is your willpower actually starts to wean down. So if you've had good, you know, good control, good willpower, you're at work, you got to deal with this stress and that stress, whatever. By the end of the night, as you get tired, that starts to wane. Yeah. So if you don't get good sleep and go to bed on time, the odds of eating Food and more yeah. food and crappy food go if up. If you don't go earth. to bed when you're tired, then yeah, and you, you're, you're you're like prolonging that. You're going to want to end up eating something. Well, totally. e- evenings and weekends, right? And we've and we talked about this in a, just a recent episode that it's how important it is to try and attach new behaviors with old behaviors. Mm-hmm. And we do really good with stuff like that. Humans do really well with oh, it's the new year. I'm starting a new diet during the work week. I'm really good because I'm on a regimen schedule. I got to be at work by eight a.m. Then I take a lunch break or a snack, whatever, a fifteen minute break at 11 o'clock and like, oh, so I'll just, I'll pair this meal with that time. I'll pair this meal mm-hmm. with that time. And they're all good. But oh, then come past off of work, 6 p.m. or the weekend, that's where shit goes awry. So a lot of that has to do with just, again, the psychological piece of totally. behavior. Now, here's a good strategy if you want to improve your sleep. Um, set yourself up a sleep routine. So give yourself 
seven to nine hours of sleep at night. So you know yourself. So if you only need less, that's fine. If you need more, that's great. And in other words, okay, I need to wake up at this time. That means I need to be in bed by this time. So let's say you've decided you need to be in bed and you need to be falling asleep at 10 p.m. Okay, two hours before that, you stop eating. So 10 p.m. is bedtime. 8 p.m. is the absolute latest I'll eat. I even recommend more than that, but two would be the minimum. At that two hour before bedtime minimum mark, um, also turn your lights off in your house or wear blue blocking glasses, get off electronics, start to wind down, prepare your body for sleep. Studies are very conclusive on this, makes a difference. You actually produce more melatonin, you get better sleep. And then when you go to bed, here's what happens. When you go to bed, you fall asleep faster, so you do get that seven or eight hours. Because I think sometimes people are so wired in, in jazz before they go to bed, electronics, lights on bright, they're eating right before they go to bed. Then they go to bed expecting to get eight hours of sleep, but the problem is that they don't fall asleep or they don't get good sleep. So now they're in bed for eight hours, but they're not getting the quality of sleep for eight hours. All right, the last one, this one's the biggest one by far. In fact, I will confidently say that this is the biggest contributor to the obesity epidemic in modern societies. It wasn't fats, it wasn't carbs, it wasn't sugars, it was the it was heavily processed, hyper palatable foods. Um, as the market grew for food, as more and more people were you know, buying food at the, at the grocery store, two things became very apparent to food manufacturers. If they made food tasty, they made it really, really enjoyable to eat. So palatability refers to the hedonistic value of food. So when you eat it, how good it makes you feel. That includes the flavor, the smell, the, the, the feel, everything, right? Food manufacturers figured out, if I can make it hyper palatable, I'll outsell everybody. And if, if, you, if you don't believe me, look at every food category, even look at the health food categories, and the top sellers at the top are the top because they're the most palatable. So that's number one. The second thing they realized was convenience. If I can make it taste really good and make it super convenient, that's what people want. So more and more of our food was turned into hyper palatable food, and more and more of us started eating more of this. Now, why is this bad? This food is literally designed to make you eat more. Um, and the recent studies, this is by far the biggest single step you can take. Recent studies show that when people are given unlimited access to heavily processed food and they compare them to, con to other groups who have unlimited access to whole natural foods, they eat on average five to 600 more calories every single day. That's incredible. Five to 600 more calories a day that roughly could equate to about a pound of body fat, give or take a little bit, per week. Yeah. Per week, well, just from that. Well, this is the one of, of the five that you've listed. This is the one by itself, if you ignored everything else and only did this, that most people would have probably tremendous success. Tremendous. Yeah. Just yeah. just from from simply from doing that. And I, this is something that, again, later on, uh, piece this together where – I mean, I could tell a client, eat, go eat whatever and as much as you want, as long as it's not processed. Oh, mm -hmm. If it was whole foods, I'd That say, became my go-to. Yeah. It was my favorite thing to tell the clients that used to kind of bitch and whine about diets or having to restrict and, uh, you know, I want to get in shape, but I really don't want to follow some stupid diet. It is, okay, we, I got something for you. You can eat all the foods you want. Just make sure they're all whole and natural. Mm -hmm. Stay away from all the heavily processed foods and that's go to town. Eat as many potatoes as yeah. you want and sweet potatoes and <laughs> yeps. Eat as much chicken breasts and steaks as you can get. Like go I for it. I always just I, I I immediately think of chips. Like chips. That is like <laughs> yeah. like the most like fantastically processed food item that they just created where you just you can't eat just one of those things. It's crunchy. It's light. It's salty. It's novel. It's got like every texture and thing that like sparks this it's this desire to keep going. And like if you add that, if somebody just ate a big ass meal and you put chips out there, they'll still eat the chips. Yeah. It's totally. And then true. they'll go right back to eating you know another meal after they ate the chips because now it just stimulate a whole new thing. Here I'll give you on that note. I'm going to give you guys a great example. This is phenomenal, right? I just found this right now. So. A large bag of Lay's potato chips, okay? If you're listening right now, be honest with yourself. Could you sit down in front of the TV by yourself and eat a large bag of Lay's potato chips? Probably yes. I could crush, I could, yeah. I could blow through three of those, no problem. <laughs> Inside every Lay's, a large la bag of Lay's potato chips is about five potatoes. Could you sit down in front of the TV and eat five plain, plain 
baked potatoes. No way. No way. Yeah. There's no possible if you way. Say yes, you're lying. You, most people. Go listen, look, good luck with two. Yeah, you would gag. Yeah. By itself, no butter, no salt, nothing. Just plain white baked potatoes right in front of you. You got five of them. You got to eat them. It would be a challenge. Didn't most they, people would they, fail. Didn't they run a diet? Wasn't there a popular diet the, for a while? The potato diet. Uh, is it the thing. potato diet? Yeah. No, it's a thing, it right? Choke. It gets yeah. emotional. No, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My people. That's the Irish. The Irish should have gets emotional. No, they yeah. did. They ra- that, that's like Fond a memories. Of that's potatoes. like a thing that they've done before. Where I've seen people do that challenge where they just, hey, I'm going to try and eat potatoes. You want to know what the irony of this is? Uh. Five plain white baked potatoes has less calories than a bag of Lay's potato chips. Yeah. Think about that. So the Lay's chips has more calories, yet far easier to blow through and eat. Yeah. than five plain baked potatoes. Now, that's because of the palatability factor. And your body naturally evolved this kind of this, this, this limit that you'll hit when you eat certain foods. You feel it when you eat steak or potato or vegetables, when you eat normal whole foods. Now, when you eat processed foods, it hijacks that. It, gets high, it, gets, uh, it goes haywire, and so you consume way more calories. This is why avoiding, simply avoiding heavily processed foods by itself. Now, you're not going to get shredded like a bodybuilder, but most people listening, if you just did that, you would probably get all natural, all by yourself, into a far more normal, average body weight. You find yourself losing body fat. It's the double-edged sword of science. Totally. Right. I mean, it's yeah. uh, and I I don't think actually a lot of people chips are delicious. I don't think a lot of people realize that that your body was created with these things built in. Mm. That if you were just roaming the earth and you know growing your own food and raising your own food and you that's the way you ate always, it actually would be way more challenging than you think to to overconsume because of all the body's natural signals that tell you, okay, I'm full. That's enough. But because so much of the American diet is these heavily processed foods, it hijacks that. Totally. And it's it's this mentality. We have this idea that we're just, because humans evolved with where food was scarce, that we've turned into these eating machines and all we need is food in front of us. Overeating in the past was just as bad as it is today. And, and, and so we do have these natural breaks that we t- turn on that tell us to stop eating. In fact, you've probably experienced this at a, at a friend's house when you've had dinner where you eat a meal and you're stuffed and then you yourself hijacked your own satiety signals by reaching for dessert. A change in flavor mm-hmm. oftentimes will get that palatability signal that what's called palate fatigue to go away. Now, processed foods are foods that come in bags, wrappers, boxes. Sometimes they're frozen. They have ingredients. This is what makes processed foods processed foods. They have lots of ingredients. So if you look at the back of a box... If it just says broccoli, it's not processed. If it just says meat, it's not processed. But if you look at the back and there's you know, 10, 15, 20, 30 different ingredients, n- most of those ingredients were not put in there to add nutritional value or to give you really any of the benefit other than increasing the hedonistic value of that food. And be aware. Be aware of that. Eliminate your heavily processed foods and watch your calories naturally drop. And with that, go to mindpumpfree.com and download our guides. They cost nothing. They're all totally free. We have books and resources there for free. You can also find the three of your favorite hosts here at Mind Pump on Instagram. three amigos. All of us. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin, Adam at Mind Pump Adam, and you can find me at Mind Pump Sal.